Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of Finance and Corporate Services to order. Hope everyone had a good weekend. Uh, we'll get right into it with, uh, well, first I'd ask if there's any disclosures of pecuniary interest. I am not seeing any, so I will look for a mover uh, for the consent item. Moved by Councillor Anitis. Any question or issue discussion? Not seeing any, those in favor? And that carries. And we'll now move on to our discussion items. The first is the Fortifer Gockel Creative Workspace Pilot Report. And we have a few delegations on this, uh, beginning with uh, Eric Rumble, the coordinator. Just point of clarification. Do you want the delegations first or are the staff presentation? Oh, sorry, I didn't have the. I think I had the staff uh, presentation here listed beforehand, but it would probably make more sense to have staff first. Great, thank you so much. Okay. This one? Oh, staff, sorry. Yeah. Okay, go I think you got the first couple slides, though. Okay. Yeah. Through the chair, thank you so much for having us uh, here today to talk about this project, the Creative Hub at 44 Gockel. We're really excited to have a few of our, our tenants and partners who will be delegating um, later today. We're also really grateful to many of you on council who came to visit 44 Gockel in the last couple of months so that we could um, show you the facility, you can meet some of the tenants yourselves um, in preparation for our presentation today. Um, could I have the next slide, please, Diana? Oh, you've got it. Thank you so much. Great. Just to recap, we started this project as a five-year pilot in 2019, and at the time, it was responding to a number of different factors in our community. Um, one important factor was the need for affordable, creative production space. Um, and while this project has really filled a need for that, we, as Eric will talk about, have full occupancy, there still remains a demand for affordable creation space. And one of the things, which I'm sure you'll hear about, is the way that space functions for people in the creative industries where, yes, it's a place to do work, but also importantly, a place to connect with other practitioners. And it's really that kind of collaboration, knowing each other, knowing each other's work that really supports um, exciting creative practices in this uh, community. And this is why kind of spaces like this and affordable space and shared space is so important. This project also offered a platform for arts activities and um, activations in our community. And we see more and more of this now with the development of the Gockel block. So what used to be kind of early stages of a pedestrianization on Gockel, we're now seeing being a really significant uh, community space and one where we have lots of tenants and activities in the building connecting with um, activities on the street. And that was really, you know, only the early part of what we understood would happen on Gockel Street. Um, and has really supported the work that's gone on in the building with our tenants in the building as well. The other kind of goal was to make use of a city facility, 44 Gockel, which um, had had very te varied tenants over the years and been used in a variety of capacities, but there was a real feeling that there was a possibility for that building um, that would bring greater, greater benefit to the community and to the arts community. So these were kind of the dynamics by which uh, this project was initiated in 2019. So, in terms of what has happened since 2019, um, I'll start by just noting that we, we had a launch, official launch party, uh, open house for the event about two weeks before COVID hit. Um, the building was about a third full at the time, um, and um, we, we obviously lost a number of tenant leads uh, at that time period, but managed to maintain the tendencies that we did have. Um, and persevere through um, public health measures, uh, working with the tenants to make all of that work. During 2021 and 2022, um, the facility use and activity uh, gradually bounced back, and we eventually hit 100% occupancy uh, last fall. Um, so we're at a point now that as, as tenants vacate the facility, we're going to a, a waiting list of other interested folks in the local arts sector to, to fill those, those newly vacated spaces. Um, there's space for about 35 tenancies in the building, many of them uh, most appropriate for, for folks with solo proprietorships. Um, and so 44 Gockel has become a home base for entrepreneurs in arts and language instruction. 
um, arts therapy and other cultural services, um, music uh, and other event production. There's visual artist practices in the building that include photography, radio, sculpture, uh, painting, printmaking, film and theater. Um, and all that multidisciplinary activity is, has led to a, a bunch of different um, activity in and around the building from concerts, broadcasts, markets, exhibits, workshops, uh, and all sorts of other productions over the last few years. Um, rent revenues have grown annually in the facility during the pilot, um, and in partnership with uh, Arts Build Ontario, we continue to improve and evolve the model. And you'll hear from Alex uh, at our partner Arts Build in a few minutes. Uh, expenses are mostly realities of the facility, uh, the, the, the utility cost of, of old building systems, property taxes, frontline custodial, ta uh, custodial staff rather, um, in internet services. Um, and uh, through the last few years, we've managed to establish a, a below, market rate, uh, below market rate framework that's um, satisfying a local need that's been expressed to the city for a long time. Um, and we've also developed um, a unique and valuable skills trade program, um, which has um, resulted in tenants contributing assets to, um, to the, um, the project and the brand. Um, a small example being some of the, the photos we've got in, um, in our presentation here today. Um, the, the sort of last point I'll make on what's happened since 2019 is, is in that time tenants and staff have really transformed um, institutional facility that very much felt like an abandoned private college when we got into it and it very much feels like a, a, a well occupied um, and, um, and decorated and beautified space that's, um, that's been occupied by artists since then. Um, one of the, the really pleasing results for us is just watching a, a number of different tenants in all different areas flourish over the course of the project. So to name a, a number of examples of that, um, I'll note um, Just Ideas, um, uh, making use of a less than 300 square foot space to set up a music production studio from which they've drawn folks from all over the continent. Um, to make music together, um, and um, that's led to millions of Spotify streams, and as many of you will be aware, uh, 2023 Judo, Judo nomination um, for the collaboration with rapper Don Valley. Um, you'll hear a little bit from uh, one half of that dynamic duo in a few minutes as well. Uh, another example, ArtShine has run instructional arts programs for youth in various city community centers um, at no cost to those facilities since 2019. Um, and that's enabled residents access to, to high quality arts instructions in those facilities. Um, Maya from Archstein is also going to come and speak a little bit about how that, that subsidized essential service, essential service rather, has rippled um, far beyond the region during arts, uh, Archstein's time there. Um, tenants are also contributing to the vitality of downtown. To give a couple of examples, we have a tenant, Midnight Raven Studios, who has um, piloted a number of witch and wellness markets uh, on the Gawker block for the last few years, including another iteration this past Friday, um, as well as a number of, of really successful and well-attended um, queer mar markets inside of the space uh, in the last year or so. Uh, another tenant, Good Co Productions, um, has been involved in uh, sharing broadcast events um, out of the facility, um, as well as con contributing pr sound production to uh, the Gawker Block and another, uh, uh, a number of other downtown um, spaces. Um, and those are really inspiring examples for, from, from established tenants that, um, as time goes on, will continue to, to ripple down to, to other folks um, who are um, uh, trying to emulate the examples of the, the sort of work that those folks have done out of the facility. A um, couple more to note, ArtSpace membership, um, of a, it's a 120 plus uh, membership group, um, artists from the regions. They now have space uh, in which to showcase their work through both a window, window gallery out front of the building um, and inside the building as well. Um, and part of what that's allowed is, is um, a, a fledging um, community group to sell artwork um, to situate their collaborative activities together um, and really expand the, expand the reach of their brand, which is um, focused on fair pay for, for artists in the region. Lastly, I'll note a couple of alumni, Alana Jewell and Luke Swinson, uh, went from running their first, um, first few very successful print sales out of the building. They quickly outgrew the space that they rented from us in 2021 in 44 Gockel and have gone on to, to make work for um, all sorts of, of fabulous international brands from Pixar to Instagram to GM uh, to the Toronto Maple Leafs, um, the Toronto Football Club, um, and so on. I'll turn it over to Emily.
Great, so the, the need for space persists. So we've got this pilot period for the last five years and have tried out this model, and it's clear that the demand for affordable space that is also situated within a community of creative practitioners um, is really something that the, <laughs> the people weren't joking when they told us they needed affordable and supportive creative space. And interestingly, while, as I say, while this has made a dent, this idea of a central hub has come up again and again um, since the introduction of this pilot and is kind of a well-known um, need within our community. We see waiting lists at Globe Studios and this kind of idea of a centralized location is still coming up in some of our early consultation work for the development of our arts and culture strategy. Um, we also know that the creative industries are one of the fastest growing sectors with a significant job, uh, job growth projection over the next number of years um, and that there is, you know, that, that it translates to our community as well. And we also know that there's so many opportunities that we've only started to explore with this project. We've filled the space, we've got multiple tenants, we have events, there's programming happening, but the new next frontier for us is thinking about how do we promote mentorship? How do we create relationships or support those relationship and collaborations to happen? What is a, a more of an accelerator model um, for creative industries look like? Um, so we're, we're really excited to be able to share some of these insights with you and share that there is a huge amount of potential and need uh, for a project like this um, at 44 Gockel and the Creative Hub. So to that extent, our recommendations for you to consider today is that we prepare a budget issue paper for ongoing operating funding uh, for this project into the future and also do some work to assess long-term um, options for the Creative Hub, um, whether at 44 Gockel or elsewhere, in, in considering kind of other kinds of space needs and constraints um, and opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks both for, your, for the presentation. There are um, a few questions, but we're going to wait until all the delegations get through and we'll come back. Uh, so just if you can queue up, but I have Councillor Schneider, Singh, Ioannidis, Johnston, and Chapman. I will come back to you after the delegations for questions of staff. Okay. And our next delegation is uh, Alex Klass from Artsville, Ontario. I'm, I'm sure staff's uh, indicated, but you do have five minutes to make your presentation, and please don't be offended if there aren't any questions, but I suspect there will be. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me speak uh, today about our experience as the on-site operating partner at 44 Gockel Creative Workspace. My name is Alex Glass, and I am the Executive Director of Arts Build Ontario. We are a provincial arts service organization, a nonprofit and charity that provides small and medium-sized organizations with tools, training, and advice to successfully manage physical and digital creative space. We support thousands of arts organizations, including 400 out of Waterloo Region. Some of our initiatives include a social purpose real estate project, uh, focused on capacity building, a one-to-one -one mentorship program that matches mentors with arts leaders uh, needing support with their space. Uh, we led a program on accessible cultural spaces to help them be compliant with the AODA, um, as well as we offer asset mapping, um, asset management software, and uh, we offer webinars and workshops that center around the development of creative spaces in general. We work with many municipalities in Ontario to build the capacity of our arts organizations. We've heard from our colleagues at Canada Council for the Arts and the Department of Canadian Heritage about a need for increased access to designated art spaces in large cities across Canada. The value of affordable designated art space cannot be overstated. Increasingly, arts organizations face significant challenges in finding and maintaining secure, appropriate, and affordable spaces for their programs, services, and operations. This challenge, exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, threatens the sustainability of arts organizations, limits access to the arts for the public, and weakens community vitality. There is a need for sustainable, long-term spaces that anchor arts organizations in the community in order to advance recovery from the pandem pandemic, not only for arts organizations themselves, but also for our community. Gawkel can be a part of the, solutions, so thus a part of the solution for Kitchener's creative workers. 
Through our long-standing relationship with the Canada Cultural Spaces Fund, they have been following this project since its inception and have expressed interest in seeing the space and concept continue. In the last few years, we've also seen other municipalities, including Kingston, Mississauga, and Toronto, intervene with space solutions through existing city-owned facilities to support their own arts communities. In fall 2022, 44 Gawka was a part of the Creative City Network of Canada's annual summit, where many municipal workers expressed their interest in the concept and the possibility of implementing a similar model in their own communities. The City of Kitchener has become a leader in providing designated art space for its creative community through 44 Gockel. Access to a creative hub to a creative hub like Gockel provides cultural workers with the resources to build their capacity and to collaborate with one another on site. As arts organizations move through financial recovery of the pandemic, many are having to balance competing priorities and securing space while maintaining operations and understanding or undertaking sustainability planning. The pilot period provided for this project um, allowed for the resources um, and time needed to cultivate a strong and collaborative community of artists, cultural organizations, and creative entrepreneurs. We've seen this space evolve over the last six years, growing to be home to over 60 tenants and short-term renters. We also saw our short-term rental spaces increase by 25% from pre-pandemic numbers. We have 100% occupancy and we have a wait list. These are good signs of artistic production in our, uh, the artistic production that's happening in our community. 44 Gockel Creative Workspace is on the precipice of even more growth. The annual funding provided to the space will allow us to focus on a programming, our programming on mentorship and business development, both for tenants and the wider community. While this work is underway, this also allows time to undertake a comparative analysis to assess long-term opportunities for 44 Gockel in this model. As the lead operating partner of this project, Artsville Ontario wishes to continue this great work and see investment made to continue to offer affordable art spaces to Kitchener's art, artists and arts organizations. We believe strongly that this next phase of the project will build on its previous success um, of the pilot the previous success of the pilot project and ensure creative workspace is embedded in our community as new developments and our population continues to grow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there are a couple of questions for you, Ms. Glass, beginning with Councillor, oh, just two, Councillor Singh. Yeah, thank you, and just uh, very quickly, it's exciting to hear the short-term rentals, actually. Um, beyond that, uh, Arts Build Ontario, uh, do you guys operate anywhere outside of this area as well? Or mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, we're Can provincial. You, you're provincial, of course. And where other municipalities that are kind of leveraging something same as a partnership uh, yeah. with your organization? in creating this kind of enterprise space or kind of incubator space for the arts community? Yeah, I mean, Aurora, the Aurora Cultural Center is embarking on a similar project that we're seeing right now um, through our mentoring program. So they are actually, that municipality and more are starting to turn to their eye to this type of model. It's more appealing because we're a nonprofit market, so it's more affordable. They can get more out of the, um, the partnership through that and on the groundwork too. Um, at the Tet Center as well in Kingston, um, which was referenced in the report, um, is another fantastic example where I see Gockel headed. Um, and then Mississauga has a small arms building. That's a municipal asset as well. Um, but those are, I think, the three top relevant ones in the city of Toronto too. But yeah, of course. Different. And they're doing relatively something similar to what yes. we're doing, or we are trying to tread some new territory as well. Sorry, what was the last part of your question? I said, are they doing something similar to what we're doing, or are the city of Kitchener in partnership is trying to do explore different avenues ah. through this partnership as well? They are doing something similar. So yeah. like the, where they're at in their project, um, I believe that's the next phase of this work here. So I, I think what I'm trying to answer your question is say it's a similar model, um, but they might be the way that they're focusing um, in those projects would be different um, in the disciplines that they're supporting. So that could be like a theater space versus a hub. Um, the Tet Center is the most comparable. Okay, and as a, as a funding to Arts Build Ontario, it primarily comes from the province, I'm assuming, or? <laughs> You'd think so, yeah. um, but no, Canada Council for the Arts um, gives us project money uh, to undertake work uh, to support cultural infrastructure in Ontario and Canada, um, and then we get a lot from the Department of Canadian Heritage. Okay. And Ontario and Arts Council. Do you think there are opportunities where, as we explore and we do want to scale up, and that's where I do see some benefits of us starting to explore the fact that it's you know a few years in now? Yes. Um, are there funding options out there? Oh yes. 
Um, Canada Cultural Spaces Fund is definitely the primary funder for cultural infrastructure across Canada. Ontario, it's our only funder designated for cultural spaces and municipalities are eligible. Okay, all right, thank you. No problem. Thank you, Councillor Chapman. Yeah, thank you and thank you for your presentation. Um, so you have space at 44 Gawkel right now. Mm -hmm. um, I notice in the report it's asking us to look at um, the budget in 2024 and 2025. Do you see yourselves maintaining that space beyond that date or? Oh yeah, Waterloo Region has been our home for, oh my gosh, over 10 years. So um, we we see the value in this project. Um, it's valuable for the community here and our, our um, network here. And we have a great partnership with the City of Kitchener. So of course we want to continue it. Okay, thank you. There are no more questions. Thank you for your presentation, Ms. Les. Thank you. Uh, our next delegation from uh, Arts, Arts Shine, Arts for All, is Maya Grubasek. Apologies if I mispronounce that. Hi, good afternoon, City Councilors and Chair. My name is Maya Grubisic. I am an artist instructor with Art Shine since 2018 and now French program coordinator. And I will be speaking on behalf of Art Shine about our experience at 44 Gockel. So we were the city's first skilled trade partner at 44 Gockel's creative workspace starting in 2019. And a little bit about Art Shine. Um, we run it as a social enterprise with our mission being to create a community where participation in the arts is not limited by income, ability, or life circumstances. It was started by Paul Field, a social worker, in 2015 who um, saw the positive impact of the arts on the youth. Um, we currently offer virtual workshops and in-person school programs where French and English instructors teach art classes in local schools and in nearly 20 cities across Ontario. We offer our accessible program to people with various disabilities, local art camps, and our Art Shine in a Box, which is a North America-wide subscription art program. For each box we sell, we give one away for free. Art Shine believes in the importance of partnerships as they create visibility and benefits for everyone involved. We have partnerships with Comeback Snacks, for example, uh, Peace by Chocolate, and um, with Spectrum, offering them Youth Under the Rainbow art workshops. Our greatest partnership, though, is with the City of Kitchener, where we both benefit from the in-kind rent subsidy model. Through our arrangement with the City, we offer youth, work, um, youth workshops available at various community centres each year. In 2023, for example, we offered free monthly art workshops um, at Kingsdale Community Centre, Chandler Moat, Victoria Hills, and Centreville Chicopee. The value of Art Shine's instructor wages, materials, and administrative expenses in delivering these programs are exchanged for a reduced annual uh, rental rate at 44 Gockel. These communities benefit from the positive impacts of the arts, from building confidence to facilitating emotional healing, and that's just some of the few ways that the arts can transform someone's life. Art Shine's ability to build and grow an operating model from a stable, affordable home base in Kitchener has also led to incredible results beyond the region. So since 2015, Art Shine has delivered more than $1 million worth of free or subsidized workshops in schools, community centers, social service agencies, shelters, seniors' homes, prisons, and at many 2SLGBTQ plus events. We also provide employment opportunities to artists in the areas we serve. So as artists, we often need a side job, and Archon helps city residents fill that financial gap. Having our office at 44 Gockel has many benefits. It's a shared collaborative space, um, very important for sharing resources and networking. It's also a safe space to exchange ideas and talk about the challenges we face um, as artists. Art Shine believes that we are stronger together. 44 Gockel really highlights this. And without the city of Kitchener's support, uh, we definitely would not have survived through the pandemic. As an arts organization, we really feel like we've been supported to attain our mission. And while Art Shine's example is exceptional, many small businesses in the arts sector are made more resilient with access to affordable workspaces. And because of these subsidy programs and the programs that flourish from them, Residents here really see that their city cares about the arts and culture, and we have seen firsthand how the arts and culture can change a person's life. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there is just one question, Councillor Schneider. 
Thank you, Chair Davey. Thank you so much for coming in and thank you for the great work that you're doing uh, at 44 Gockel. Um, could you speak a little bit about uh, how you adapted during COVID? Because Art Shine also did a lot of great work during uh, the pandemic in, in keeping people connected and giving them something to do with art. Yes, yeah, so when we first got hit with the pandemic, um, we kind of froze. We didn't know what to do, I think, like many, many of us. Um, and uh, we started offering um, free YouTube art workshops. So all of our instructors, just to, to keep them on, on salary to pay art artists, um, many of us just stayed on creating little art workshops at home. And it was a really great way for, for kids and parents who were still working at home while they're, you know, you're, you're trying to manage your kids. Kids weren't even in school. So it was really great to keep us employed and to keep the children busy. Um, and then that fall of 2020, we started offering uh, virtual art workshops because we weren't able to be in schools anymore. Um, that kept us employed as well. We did have to cut down um, our staff quite significantly. Um, and then I started on as French program coordinator. So with um, the use of a French uh, federal grant, it allowed us to teach virtually in schools. So schools were getting these free workshops, yet we were still receiving um, funding from this grant. So that really allowed us to survive through the French, um, the French side of ArtShine. Um, and that really is what that and the, the uh, subsidy for, for renting the, the space at 44 Gockel is what really kept us alive, I would say. And now we've started uh, since last fall back um, our in-person school programs, which has been great. Mm -hmm. I know it's kind of hard to explain in just five minutes all that you do, but I know that you're, you're doing some great work too in, in helping uh, people who have been incarcerated and, and those, those programs as well. So it's very, uh, very great to have an uh, organization like yours operating out of one of our facilities and making such an impact all across the country. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, there are no further questions. Thank oh. you. Uh, apologies, there is actually one uh, additional delegation. Uh, Jorge Pineda from Just Ideas. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me and uh, allowing me to speak a little bit about uh, our experience and what 44 Gockel means to Just Ideas. Um, I've heard COVID be mentioned a lot, and that has a huge role in how we ended up at Gockle. Um, you know, I've been doing music since I was eight years old. I'm now 33, and in that time, I had been part of studios in garages, bedrooms, basements, anything you can think of. Uh, we made a, um, a studio there. Uh, during COVID, we were using my basement as a studio, and my partner, Josh, he uh, actually caught COVID. So my wife said, no more sessions at the house. And uh, then we turned to Zoom. And uh, we were both working in the same city, but we're working on Zoom. Um, and people started here. About two weeks into COVID, uh, we learned how to run sessions wherever we were. We could record and stream our audio in real time to whoever else was on this call. Um, so we quickly became the guys that could uh, do Zoom sessions. And within that month, like a uh, few months in, we were doing sessions with people from Miami, LA, Indianapolis, everywhere. And that just uh, started to uh, snowball effect for us. And um, we just kind of kept going and going. And it got to the point where we got a little too busy to be working out of the basement. And um, I remember I actually came to the open house at 44 Gawko and a friend of mine had a room there and uh, at the time, they didn't really have studio space available. COVID happens, I started reaching out to these friends, and he says, hey, I actually gave my room up. So I, that's when I got in contact uh, with, with everyone over at Gockle, and uh, they said, okay, well, you know, the space is available. Um, this is how much the rent is. Uh, would you like to come and see it? I said, no, I'll take it. And the reason why we jumped at it so fast is because of the costs. Um, you know, we've done so much research and trying to find a space. We're not a, a foot traffic business. Um, both Josh and I are entrepreneurs in the, in the city and we really love Kitchener. 
Um, a question we get asked often is, what is the number to pull you guys to Toronto? What is the number to get you guys to move to LA? And for us, there really right now, there is no number. We are trying to put Kitchener on the map in the music space. Uh, we work in a bunch of different genres. It's obviously on the map in some genres, but not quite uh, in hip hop, R&B, Latin, which is where uh, we've been working a lot in that space. So we got into Gockle. A few months later, we team up with an artist named Don Valley from the area. Day one, he comes in the studio. We show him uh, a track that was for somebody else. He loves the beat, writes on it, uploads it on TikTok. Next day, it's at a million views. His label saying, we need to get this out. Christmas is coming up, so put a pause until January. That song came out. That song has led to uh, Dom actually going on a countrywide tour. He became one of Amazon's artists to watch for 2023. And the latest news was that we received a Juno nomination and we got to spend that time over there. And uh, really, it, it, we were really proud that our table was um, out of 12 seats, 10 of us were from Kitchener. And that's kind of like the mentality behind the space at Gockle. A lot of our work is done in the city. We do travel a lot for work, but everything we're learning, we're bringing back to the city and really helping uh, develop artists and kind of showing them you know, I've had a lot of great mentors, and that's something that we want to be for this next generation of artists and musicians because you can, music is everywhere. It's in TV, commercials, the list goes on, video games, and a lot of the times, you know, music comes from dreams and it gets shut down really quick. And I think we're slowly showing people that it is possible. Um, you know, we are homeowners in Kitchener and we just love it here, and there's so much possibility. Um, and the future is super bright. Um, another thing that 44 Gawko allowed us to do was partner up with Amit uh, from Goodco, who's also a tenant there, and he allowed us to make our own show at the museum where we were able to bring in, uh, it started with one, and he was in our studio, actually. We have a lot of traffic coming from other towns, and the artist that was with us at the time, he's a Grammy-nominated artist, and he was the first person I said, hey, we have this kind of show idea what do you think? And he's like, I'm in. He didn't ask any other questions, and we used that as leverage to invite all these other artists, and we had 800 pre-saved tickets, and that night we had about 600 people come through the door and hear music that I can almost guarantee they would have never heard uh, live in front of them at the museum. So uh, I think that's my time, but thank you. Thank you so much. There are a couple of counselors with questions, beginning with Councillor Schneider. Thank you, Chair Davey. Uh, first question is, can I, sometime, I want to stand in that studio, I want to meet you and see where all this greatness is created. So that's my first question. <laughs> I'd love to connect and, and meet up with you there. Sure. Um, what you're doing, I think, is fantastic. And uh, can you maybe tell us uh, what it takes to get an artist who maybe comes in a little raw and get them to the next level and the next level and the next level mm -hmm. uh, with your expertise and guidance? Yeah, I mean, I think, with the way and the rate that music is moving at today, a lot of people say, oh, you know, you just record yourself and put yourself on TikTok and the rest will take care of itself. And it doesn't actually work like that. Um, there's a lot of work, a lot of hours, um, a, lot of, a lot of the artists that we do end up working and developing here are artists that we have found online or somebody has told us, hey, this person has a buzz. They just need the right guidance. Um, so the time that goes into it, we're talking about, you know, anywhere from six to eight hour sessions, uh, multiple times a week. A lot of the times we're leaving Gockle as the birds are chirping in the morning, you know, we're there all night. And uh, yeah, it, it is a lot of work. And then that and, and teaching them the next steps because, okay, now you have a recorded song. What is the next step? Who's gonna hear it? How are they gonna hear it? And what makes you different from anybody else? Um, so that's kind of the approach that, that we take in um, guiding them. Okay, great. And yes, you're, you're welcome anytime. <laughs> okay, well, we'll connect. You know, love to see that. Um, one of the things that's being considered is um, maybe a possible uh, different location for this. And uh, um, I absolutely love the concept of, of 44 Gockle. I, I love the feel when you walk in there. Um, did you feel that this could be, um, you know, recreated at a different location? I mean, that I don't think I have the answer to in terms of like, it's just one of those things, if you build it, they will come, is kind of my mentality. 
um, which is what we did at Gockle. Like they said earlier, we have less than 300 square feet and that studio is filled with talent from all over the world. And um, as, as much as, like we're in Toronto a lot, but as much as we do that drive, now artists are willing to do that drive. And uh, there, there's a debate going on right now amongst all the artists that uh, they think we have the best pizza in town out at the back of the Lancaster. All right. Yeah. So. <laughs> that is great. Well, I just want to thank you for planting your flag in Kitchener and, and bringing greatness here and creating greatness here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chair Davey, and thank you so much for coming in. I didn't catch your name right at the beginning. Sorry. Uh, so my name is spelled J-O-R-G-E. So some people say Jorge, some George. I go by both. So nice to meet you, Jorge. Nice to uh, meet you. And thank, thank you. you for coming in. So um, it was really exciting to uh, to hear your story about uh, how you got involved at 44 Gockle and what you were doing beforehand in terms of trying to uh, operate out of your house and then talking about all these people that you're working with um, virtually across, uh, well, across North America, for sure. So um, what, what do you think is uh, the importance of, of 44 Gockel in terms of keeping you here? And because it sounds like you, you could go to lots of other places. So yeah. maybe if you can expand on, on that and then what you're able to bring here because, because of 44 Gockel. Yeah, I think what we're able to bring is the experience that we're learning everywhere else. Um, we're in a very privileged position to be in rooms uh, with some great conversations, some great experience being shared towards our way. Um, and yeah, I do think it is, it can grow to be something amazing. Um, you know, we get invited a lot to, they're called writing camps or producer camps. Um, and so there's a space in Toronto called Kilometer House and there's another one called Coalition House in uh, Scarborough. And it's like similar ideas, but it's just these hubs where it's, a, it's all creatives, but it's all creatives that are doing something at a great level, and they just might not have that exposure yet. But the, for example, the place Kilometer House, you can be there and you're going to the washroom and you're walking by somebody that just won five Grammys, and you would never know. And you know you find you have these conversations, and they start teaching you these things. That it's just that community, and I, I think that's the answer. It's the community that's at Gockle. I think um, it's a very safe space. You can come in there and and work, and everybody's on the same wavelength as as uh, they just want to be creative and, and push Kitchener forward and the arts here forward. And and I do think somewhere like Gockle is necessary to do that. Thank you. Thank you, and last question is from Councillor Odini. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, so first of all, I want to uh, request that you infuse Afrobeats into the music that is recorded over there. So uh, I got a good story about that, but I'll, I'll wait for your question. You got something for me? I got, I got, I got a story, yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Um, as we're looking at uh, replicating this somewhere else, what do you think we can do better in terms of um, studios. Uh, I know you mentioned the space you have is about 300 square feet, but what could be done better in terms of design for the other ones? Uh, just on the, t if, if it gets to just, I would just say on the technical side, a little bit more soundproofing. Mm -hmm. That's really about it. Everything else is amazing. Um, we are lucky enough to have that first unit that you'd actually need a key card to get into. And that's amazing for us because, you know, being downtown, we we have no fear about leaving, you know, thousands of dollars of equipment stored there. Um, so we have that, um, you know, we have great staff there that uh, answers any questions that we need. And, um, but yeah, I think, I think that's the only thing. Like the, the washrooms are fine. The, the parking is fine. Like everything is fine. It's just more so on the technical side. If there was more soundproofing, that would be ideal for studios. Okay. And this is off the map as well. How do we get Kitchener? On the music map, I guess that could... I mean, I would say Kitchener has been on the music map for a long time. I would just say that it's not in the genres that's popular with kids, or 25 and under, let's say. You know, we, we have great notoriety in country. Um, I toured in country for about six years, and I'd be on the road, and I'm in an elevator, and, oh, how you been? I play for so-and-so. Oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm from the small town, Kitchener. And I'm from Kitchener. And then that would happen all the time. Um, you know, blues, you know, we have Blues Fest, um, we used to have the, the Gospel Fest down here as well. I, th I think it is on the map, but I'm just saying more 
these newer genres that have become pop. You know, hip hop is now pop. Um, Afrobeats is definitely on its way to become the new wave. Latin music is now pop. Um, I think we're, when you think Kitchener or Kitchener music, Afrobeats isn't at the forefront of your head. Uh, Latin, reggaeton, it's not at the forefront. But now we do have a Rap Single of the Year nomination. So that shows the rest of, of the country that we, we are allowed at the table. We are allowed to, to say we have hip hop producers in Kitchener. Um, so I think that just more of that, you know, there is gonna, it's not gonna be long before, oh, we actually do have a Kitchener, uh, Kitchener artist in Afrobeats, his name's Nanzo Amadi. He's signed to Universal Music and uh, yeah, I haven't met him personally, but he is a Kitchener resident from what I've learned. Thank you. Actually, one, one more question from Councillor Singh. Not really a question I couldn't resist uh, when uh, my colleague, uh, Councillor Oduni, mentioned uh, Afropops. Can't miss out on Bhangra music, you know, India Bhangra music. You got to incorporate that. You want to make it pop, that's where you got to focus on. But I just quickly want to, you know, congratulate you on For your sure. emerging success and making yeah. Kitchener vibrant as well. Thank you. It is, it is on the list of, of things to attack. Uh, we were at the Junos with AP Dillon, yep. who's made an amazing impact. Uh, this last week we met uh, a Tamil producer um, who's, you know, he's at well over 150,000 followers and he wants to get in the studio together, so. Well, the thing is we have a worldwide audience now and sure. uh, especially if you can capitalize on the diversities of music and the emerging talent that's coming out of very diverse communities, I think if you can uh, allow a pathway, that's phenomenal, uh, especially if that's happening on a Gokula as well. For sure, I agree. Cheers. Okay, actually, one more, Councillor Anders, just queued in. <clears throat> Thank you for, for coming in, George, and uh, I'll introduce you to another George who's uh, and uh, who's won a, a Juno for engineering in wow. Toronto. George Sierra? Yeah. Big fan. Um, the type of clientele that you're seeing, where, where are you finding your clientele? Like where? Um, a, a, well, a lot of the one around here is word of mouth and social media. Um, uh, you know, they, a lot, Dom, Dom Valley, he has a big social media presence and he does a great job of tagging us in uh, productions that we've done for him. Uh, he records a lot of his TikTok videos inside 44 Gockle. So a lot of that, like, when any of these artists tag us in one of these posts, our followers go up for anywhere from like 30 to 100 people um, in a day. So that's where a lot of the ones around here, and then in, in, let's say in like the bigger side of the industry, a lot of that is just, they've heard stuff we've done, um, and through our management, we have managers in Toronto and in LA currently. Okay. Um, again, yeah, I do appreciate everything you, you're bringing to our community, and uh, as, as Councillor Schneider puts it, if you need anything, we're here to help you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, and that does fit all the, all the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you to all of you to come in and sharing your thoughts. Uh, we will now get into questions with staff. I'd recommend uh, Mr. Rumble and Ms. Robs. You might want to have a seat because there's quite a few that have questions. Uh, if everyone wanted to queue in now, I do have the original order. Okay, and beginning with Councillor Schneider. Thank you, Chair Davey. Um, Eric and Emily, thank you so much for this. Thanks for all the great work that's being done there. Um, you know, recently when I attended the, the Young Art exhibition, uh, just incredible. But uh, kind of what struck me was, was the space. And I, I know that's a space that we took and put people in with what we had. And I know there's challenges with that building. There's infrastructure stuff that has to be dealt with. Uh, I, like, 100% support the concept and appreciate the vibe and the energy that's in that building uh, that the artists who are creating in there are are doing and you know it, well, one of the recommendations it is um, you know looking at a, a, another location um, and I kind of asked uh, you know Jorge uh, about the the concept and can can that be recreated somewhere else 
Well, I'm wondering for what your thoughts are on that and maybe what you've heard from others too. Like you don't want to lose that specialness, but at the same time, I think there's more opportunity for better exhibition space for, for our art exhibitions and, and performances and things like that. Sorry, one second. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Robinson. You, you can stay queued in too. Great, thank you so much. Uh, through the chair, great question, Councillor Schneider. Um, the, that, the building at 44 Gockel was really kind of a, a building that was available to us to try this concept out and to really pilot it and develop it. So I would say we have made really good use of a space that has some really significant constraints. And I guess I would also say it is also fitting approach for our arts and culture community who really can like make magic <laughs> in a variety of spaces that are not necessarily suitable. So as, as George mentioned, there are some really specific kinds of constraints to that building. The sound situation is one of them. We also on the main floor it constructed these modular walls because that's what we could do. Um, but it does create some challenges in terms of contemporaneous uses. I think what's important about the space and you know we've got a model that works but the space itself needs to be able to develop um, along with the folks who are using the space. So it really feels um, to the folks who are using it like their own space and like somewhere they can, they can kind of create their own, um, their own kind of proprietary space that suits their work. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, but I think what's really important about this project is we have a model that really works. We know the kinds of uses that make sense and it works well in 44 Gockel and it can work elsewhere too. Yeah, okay, that, that's good to hear. I mean, I think it's something that, that it, it was a made in Kitchener thing. It is, it, we've created it, um, kind of perfected it, and I hope that uh, there is a new location that we, we keep that concept. And just as a comment, there's one thing, as a radio guy, I would love to see uh, a permanent home for Midtown Radio, for them to have some space that they don't have to keep moving back and forth from. So just a thought there, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are running a bit over time in seven already, we just started, so I would ask if we could uh, keep our uh, questions succinct if we could and have comments after. Uh, there are a few people in the queue. Next is Councillor Singh. I think that last comment was for me to be succinct, but I don't think it's possible. Uh, that being said, um, you know, I totally agree with everything that Councillor Schneider has said. I'm in full agreement, and I think I really appreciate him focusing on the scaling up part of it. The question at hand is not why shouldn't we support this, what's being in the report, but how can we you know, start looking at uh, something further? So if you could answer that, where do you see some of the vision if uh, committee and then council supports this and issue paper comes back and we incorporate in 2024 budget, what type of timeline uh, should we look at it, seeing some visions of a larger space, more collaborative space? Sorry, just to, cl to clarify. So scaling up, an another location or a larger location. And my question is, uh, additional to that, do we want multiple spaces or having another space that could incorporate everything and could potentially be kind of collision space between art and tech as well? Right, sorry, thank you for the clarification through the chair. So there are huge opportunities. So as we've mentioned, we have a waiting list for what we currently have at 44 Gockel. Um, as I mentioned in our presentation, Globe Studios, which has studio space for visual artists, also has a, a, a waiting list. There are huge potentials for kind of more technical shared resources, like for digital media. So for example, we're unable to use the basement at 44 Gockel, but there is a great kind of scheme that we could use that for recording and green screen and different types of studio spaces. So there are, is a need for specialized space, like digital media, as I've mentioned, but also rehearsal, rehearsal space as well. So the, the bigger vision here is to understand how we can kind of meet those needs in a way where folks are bumping into each other and where people can cross paths. And it's really that, that cross pollination and people learning from each other that is kind of the magic of it. So to answer your question about is it like multiple locations or one bigger location, I think what's most important is that we have a mix of mm -hmm. different types of disciplines and activities in one space to help support that cross pollination. Um, 
So that, I mean, that's not exactly answering your question. No, it but does. I, it just shows yeah. that there are multiple options. There's exactly. not just one model that could fit. Potentially, it's just the growth can happen in varying stages, be it one large location but or smaller satellite around the downtown or other parts of the community. The, the other question is um, um, more towards sustainability. Is there a way that we can approach? Right now, there is a lot of subsidization that's happening to, um, to the, um, you know, the businesses that are there, and rightly so. But are we really enforcing, encouraging mentorship and kind of graduation out of that space? Yeah, sure. Through the chair. Yes, so that we've really piloted this model. We've had five years, four and a half years to see how people move through the space. And so we've learned kind of how it works, what the specific building that we're in costs. So there is definitely opportunity to refine that model. And, and there is opportunity to kind of have less, fewer costs if the space was different, for example. So it's not, I don't want to make it seem like it's a perfect thing the way it is. There's definitely room to, to iterate on this, on this uh, model that we've developed. And that's something that would be explored through the issue paper then, so that's that we correct. can see not necessarily just what would be incorporated into the next budget, but potentially um, additional improvements that could be done through the operations. Okay, one last question, my time left. Um, about love my business kind of concept. Is there, is there an avenue where we can really celebrate the success stories uh, through love my business or potentially through that website where we show the, uh, the evolution of these small businesses that are in the arts and creative industries and then them scaling up or growing or the way they kind of converge and benefit the community at large? That's my last question, thank you. I think that was the same. Yeah. No problem, uh, Mr. Bloom. Yeah, I think absolutely. I think through the chair, what you've heard today is the power of the of 44 Golf Club is not the building; it's the people that have uh, that are doing amazing things uh, professionally and for our community in that building. And I think rightfully so. The more we can tell the story, their story is better for them, better for community, better for all of us. So absolutely, perfect. So yeah, if you can consider the the showcasing the stories and love my business, uh, I'd love to move this, Mr. Chair, if no one else has asked. Certainly, no one has. Thank you. Uh, next is Councillor Ioannidis. He beat me to the punch, Paul. Uh, anyways, that's okay. I'm just happy to see that that we have uh, other members that feel the same way as I do. So, which is a, which is a really good thing. Um, I guess the few questions that I do have: um, Do we have any other? Do we have a sense that, like, let's say in Waterloo, Cambridge? or in the region, do we, other than Globe Studios, does anyone else sort of just have some, some a similar hub that we do? Three of the chair, no. Okay. As far as, and I wholeheartedly agree with, uh, you know, I think we should think big, and, and I really, this is something that I envisioned many, many, many years ago when before we started going through this process, so it's no surprising that it's busy, uh, and we have the waiting list. Or what kind of government funding can we is out there that we can accelerate this? Yeah, through the chair, great question. So I think our best prospect is the, and Alex mentioned this, the, cult, the Canada Cultural Spaces Fund, um, and that there are a couple different opportunities, but they really support kind of cultural infrastructure and particularly specialized equipment. So when we think about the next kind of version of this project and if there are things like digital media studios, other types of specialized resources that are needed, to me this is our kind of number one um, opportunity for additional funding. Okay, that's great. Um, I guess my, la my last question is, have we ever thought about connecting with the Minister of Tourism, Neil Lundsman, to give him a tour and just to, and allow him to know what our vision is so that we, they're ready when we do want to apply for funding that they know what's happening? We can do that, yeah. Okay. Um, that's about it other than my comments I'm later. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair Davey. And you know what? It's like we've all we all sit together, or have all been on economic development together. So, um, and you might remember uh, Emily and Eric whenever I did my tour there. Which, by the way, I absolutely love that. One of the things that I said to you is, if you don't tell it, you can't sell it. And, <laughs> and uh, that's exactly. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Ioannidis, for your idea on bringing people in um, from the province and the feds 
come in and look at this special place where there's incredible things going on. I absolutely loved the tour there. It's so electric there, and I love the, uh, um, the sharing and that that's going on there. So one of the things that I'm interested in seeing, along with the stories uh, that would go with love, love my business, etc., is uh, just quantifying that with a lot of data in terms of how do we get the data that says, you know, this, uh, these collaborations have, have brought in people from North America to collaborate, have uh, resulted in X number of dollars that's uh, coming into our community. So how are we looking at, uh, the, those are intangible in, in many cases, but how are we looking at, at really doing that, that data piece which really does help us sell it? Great. Thanks for the question through the chair. I mean, this is really one of the challenges in the cultural sector. So there's definitely metrics for uh, the project itself, but I think you're raising some really important questions about how we quantify the impact of cultural, kind of cultural products in our community. So a great question. And luckily, or luckily, there's um, a number, as Alex mentioned, of other um, com communities looking at similar types of projects. So there's a, some really great resources across the province on kind of questions, data questions as you're posing. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm even wondering if there's some ways of uh, partnering with um, post-secondary institutions who, who might be able to uh, help with that through their arts departments um, uh, or even even the ability to talk about uh, and try and figure out working with the chamber how do we keep talent here because we have art here so maybe there's a few different angles that we can look yeah. at it from of course thank you thank you councillor Chapman yeah thank you and um, thank you for all you do both staff and, and the, the occupants of the space um, I wanted to ask if you have any concerns about what's going to happen next door at the um, Grand River, the former Grand River Transit Hub, and how that might come to impact 44 Gawkel. Uh, so, through the chair, uh, the, the uh, region, in partnership with the city, is developing a vision for that space. Uh, there's some key priorities, but they, the region has not uh, yet set out what the actual vision was for that space. Uh, I do know there's there's been lots of community comment on the need for community space as part of that uh, development as well. Uh, I think from our view is is if the space continues to operate in 44 Gockle and there's community space across the way, that's just all the, all the more is all the better. So I don't think we would ever see it as, as competition or a challenge. I think it's the more community uh, use we can drive to single area just drives bigger, bigger uh, impact overall. Okay. Um, so, you know, you talk about space. Is, is there talk about renovating the space, like making it bigger, like growing the space versus moving the space or just really? wanted to hear your thoughts on that? Yeah, through the chair, that's really kind of the body of work indicated in the second recommendation in the staff report is to really consider kind of those options. So, you know, can, what would a renovation or expansion of the current facility look like? What are alternatives to that? So that's really kind of trying to assess what, uh, what's feasible and what meets the needs of the project. Right. Okay, I guess those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clancy. Yeah, thank you so much. It's amazing what you've created in a small space. It seems like it's endless, uh, the rippling effect of all the, the rocks you're throwing. Um, yeah, I guess I wanted to take it just like, thank you, uh, Councillor Chapman. Uh, one step further, I wonder if there's a way to not, not see next door as a threat, but actually an opportunity. Like, um, you know, we're real big partners in this, and maybe there's a way to make that engagement process and the planning for moving forward more intentional, and, and just like the synergies you have with your stakeholders in the, in the room here today and, and that aren't here, kind of, um, like focus on how that could be bigger, you know, the amplify um, what we're talking about in terms of economic development, tourism, talent development. Um, and also, I just, I feel like I want to recognize the mentorship that you've created. You know, I'm, I'm so humbled that that's a big part of the value structure and how, like, um, Councilor Johnston was saying, the data collection, maybe, you know, we were just down the street from, um, Catalyst and, you know, and, um, uh, uh Communitech and Velocity and to me that there's a lot of, we can, you know, 
you know, create it with that kind of a framework, you know what I mean? Um, and just recognizing what you're doing and marketing that story of mentorship and, and skill development and leadership as well. Just some thoughts, but yeah, thank you so much for bringing your talent to Kitchener. We get to hear the good news all the time from constituents who are so grateful to live in a space where they get to look at beautiful art, they get to have their kids participate in meaningful programming, they get to hear awesome cutting edge music. And that was very, it's very apparent all the time. So you spilled out onto the street and I can't wait to see what block you take over next. Okay, so staff not responding. Okay, just checking. Uh, there's no one else in the queue for questions. I just have a, a couple myself. Um, well, first of all, I just echo. I mean, I'm not looking for an answer, but I would echo. I was going to ask a question. that has been asked. Um, talking with the region regarding the terminal space, if there is any possible opportunity there, um, especially since they're. I think I read recently that they're dealing with contamination in the near future. Um, my question is, I'm, just, I'm still struggling a bit with the the focus of the space. So I get that there are various groups that serve very specific purposes like your like you know like art shine and the rehearsal rental space. But for the for the folks that are renting it um, in the more accelerator center type um, pathway, do we have like a do we have like a graduation sort of process in place? Like is there now that we're capacity, I'm concerned that you know we need to make sure there aren't and again, I don't know the ins and the outs of all the tenants, but to ensure there aren't tenants that are there that are using it more as a, you know, a hobby space versus a, an economic development space. So is there plans in place for that? Yeah, through the chair. Great question. So I guess I just want to kind of clarify, and I think you've done a good job kind of having two kind of streams to the activity, right? So unlike in the accelerator center, if we use that as an example, which has an entire program dedicated to supporting those businesses in those clients through a very specific um, curriculum and program with a particular goal and at the end of them graduating out of that program, which also is related to space, we don't have a formalized program. Like there's no intake process for a particular program that offers those types of services. So the version of this project right now is primarily focused on affordable affordable space and the community um, kind of the community of practice that has been that has developed around that. So the next kind of the bigger vision of this is like what are those services? What is the model by which those types of services can be offered um, can be offered to to folks using that space. So I guess my, my answer to your question is at this point, it's really the track right now is around tenanted space and can, thinking about kind of how do we partner what is an actual program for acceleration in the same way that we see in the tech space. That's really the next um, the next frontier. There was no there's nobody delivering that in the same way that we have currently in the tech space. Okay, thank you. That, that actually makes a lot of sense. So then that sort of answers my follow-up question, which is going to be in the report you detailed the growth in the field and uh, the expected uh, job um, requirements and demand in the future. So I would assume that when you go through that process, you'll be looking at some of the uh, growth fields like graphic designers, illustrators, 3D artists, all that sort of thing. That's going to be excellent. Okay. Uh, very good. There are no further questions. We are in comments. Uh, again, I'd ask if you could keep them brief, beginning with Councillor Ionetis. Thanks, Chair Davey, and uh, I want to thank staff for, for the excellent work that they're doing, and, uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, Art Shine, and I want to thank uh, Arts Build for, you know, without you, and, and also all their other tenants, we wouldn't be as successful without you, so I really do appreciate all that you offer to, to make this successful, and, and to me, it's been, it's actually no surprise to see this place uh, wanting to be attraction towards this community i know we've had uh, the, our community has been really underserviced when it comes to arts for a long 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 time so uh to me it's really no surprise and and i love the fact that we're hearing uh, you know some of the really good success stories and uh and again i'm 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 more than happy to support uh the, the big vision here uh, uh i i feel like we do have that and we and we could definitely accommodate that. I just think we need to build a better. I mean, build a business case, not a better business. Build a. We I think we've done a good job in doing that. So, anyways, happy to see this and happy to support this. Councillor Michaud. Thank you. Um, I want to thank staff and all the tenants at uh, Gaco for for all the hard work that you've done. I think it's absolutely remarkable uh, where you're at now. Um, my first year, my first 
in my first term, the first year, I did a tour of that center, and I, it's, it's just unbelievable the stories that are coming out of there now. So, I, uh, I too would support, um, you know, your vision of growing. I think, uh, I think a healthy arts community is is important to the health of of of, of the entire community. So, congratulations. Thank you, Councillor Michaud. Uh, Councillor Singh. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for proving the naysayers wrong. Thank you for proving the proof of concept that this, uh, this can work to um, you know, support and nurture the arts and creative industry in the city of Kitchener. You know, it's not necessarily in bigger metropolitan areas that this can, can benefit, but it's also you know, mid to emerging large cities like us uh, that can be epicenter for, you know, kind of amazing content that comes out. You know, someone that's out of the space that can get nominated for Juno's award. That's a huge success story. So to our staff, to Archbuild Ontario, to be a collaborative partner, to, you know, previous, uh, the, the um, um, who else was it? Accelerator Center that was there before, right? Um, just the showing that there can be a collaboration between the creative industry and the tech community as well that can help kind of nurture this type of uh, collaborative space. Uh, so I'm very happy to move the item, very happy to support it. I don't see this necessarily just um, as a way of, you know, carrying on the day-to-day -day business of what's being uh, envisioned or as a want to uh, look at the issue paper for next year. I hope to see this as a launching pad where we've shown that it can succeed. Now how can we make it larger? How can we bring more? Um, you know, those uh, creators into this fold and start creating a sustainable model. Um, it can't be all subsidized. It has to be, some, you know, at the emerging. So it almost needs to be stages, right? And then, um, and I, as I said through my, my question and comment earlier a little bit, is that we have to really champion the success stories. Uh, we have to have a greater buy-in from the wider community to see the benefits overall how you know the collaborators or those uh, those occupants in uh, at Gokul, how they're benefiting our outlining neighborhoods, our community centers. I really want to give credit to Councillor Davey because he really brought this uh, idea up. I mean, just a, a general conversation between us, and he said he would love to see more kind of showcasing of the, these arts in our community centers, where youth can be excited and motivated as well. So if there's a way for our staff to look at in-kind, um, you know, uh, in-kind return uh, for that subsidy, we have to start giving that payback to the community. Not later, more so now, and that's something I would hope to see as part of that issue paper. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Councillor Janot. <clears throat> thank you, Chair Davey, and uh, thank you again, like everybody else has said, to the staff and, and to the delegates, to the artists, um, who have made this space what it is. Um, I know uh, Eric and Emily and Alex uh, back at I beat February, I had my first look at 44 Gockel and from outside, it doesn't look like a, an art studio, but when you walk inside, it's just amazing. And the amazing stuff that is taking place. Um, and you know, with our population growing, uh, with more and more newcomers coming to our, our, our region, you know, I'm excited about the opportunity to grow what you have already um, and to make it a world-class venue for artists to come into our community and say wow I can't believe what they're doing um, we want to do that where we are or we want to come where you are and, and we're going to relocate um, and so keep up the good work folks um, it, yeah it's, it's an amazing space and that whole little area right there that's just a, it's a cool vibe um, what what's happening there now it's, it's really great so thank you very much Thank you, Councillor Schneider. <coughs> Thank you, Chair Davey. Uh, the great thing about queuing in later is uh, I don't have to say all the great things that have already been said. But uh, I just want to thank uh, staff and I thank, thank the artists and, and, and thank you, ArtsPay. Thank you, ArtShine, uh, for the good work. And I agree with Councillor Johnson. We, we have to spread the word. We have to get the word out there and uh, get the community in to uh, see the great work there as well. So full support of this. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll be supporting this as well. I uh, thank you, Councillor Singh, for uh, for reminding me raising it. But I do think that one of the pathways going forward is, you know, when we walk through the city, we've seen all. We, I think we all see these empty 
blank walls that are really canvases and that sort of thing. And uh, the fact of the matter is the folks in, in this facility are subsidized and if that's a way that they want to uh, promote some of their in-kind work, depending on whatever their skill set is, whatever their artistic ability is, I would leave that to staff to try and figure that out. I know some of it's already being done in terms of music and that sort of thing, but I would really like to see that come forward. And really that's a way to show the broader community the benefits of this project as well. Um, I, I'm going to support I do want to be a little careful in terms of my commitments now because while it's amazing, um, in terms of the supporting what's there, I'm 100% there. In terms of going forward and growth, uh, we have all kinds of financial challenges in City Kitchener, so it is going to have to compete in terms of the growth aspect in my mind uh, at the next budget. But I do have to say, just in closing, that I'm not the most artistic guy in the world, but when I went on that tour, even I could feel like that, the creative energy of that space. And so thank you for making that... Um, that investment, that investment work. I'm looking forward to see what we can do. So it's been moved by Councillor Singh. Uh, those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Mr. Bloom. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Committee. I just wanted to take a quick moment to uh, do an uh, important thank you to Eric and Emily, who uh, uh, for, for council, for the, for the new members of council, uh, many years ago, council gave us an allotted amount of funding and it was a very conscious decision on our part not to use that funding for staffing but to, to try to get as most, much of that to be an impact to our arts community. So Eric and Emily stepped up and really took on leadership of, of this facility and taking on new functions and new roles that were not part of their, their regular job description of overseeing a building with multiple tenants that's 24 hours and all the relationship building that, went, that has gone on. So I've gotten personally to see uh, both the great sides and the challenging sides, and I just wanted to commend them for uh, what you see today is largely a part of their leadership in building relationships with, with all of the partners in the building and maintaining uh, such an amazing track record for this facility. So I just wanted myself to, to congratulate the two of them for an amazing many years so, and many more to come. So. Very much Thank you. Good. Thank you, Eric Emily. Excellent work. Okay, with that, we are going to be moving on to our Next item, which is the community benefits charge direction. And I believe Mr. Lautenbach is going to kick us off. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Davey and members of the committee. Uh, Mr. Hagee originally was going to be delivering this presentation, but something unexpected came up, and so I agreed to, to cover this today and answer any questions that you might have related to the report that's on the agenda. Um, I think it's important first to start by talking a little bit about how the community benefits charge framework came to be. So um, originally back in 2019, Bill 108 was passed, which proposed the community benefits charge um, as a potential replacement for some of the elements that were included in uh, development charges. There was then some feedback provided to the province. There was other amendments that were made under Bill uh, 138. And then the final sort of framework that exists right now as an option uh, for council to consider uh, came through Bill 197. Um, but I think the important thing to note is that the end result of what was implemented was very different from what was originally planned. So in terms of the original legislation, it was intended to sort of replace development charges, in, in particular soft services. So things like indoor recreation, outdoor recreation, libraries, those types of services were contemplated that a CBC would cover off um, collecting funds to fund all of that growth related infrastructure and based on feedback that was received uh, the province then uh, made some adjustments when the final sort of framework was developed soft services were still able to be funded fully through development charges and so that was something that we were um, glad to see at the time uh, but CBC's were then used as sort of a tool that could fund other capital costs of any public service associated with new growth. So anything that was not already recovered from development charges or parkland provisions could be um, put in a, uh, a community benefits charge uh, strategy and then funded through uh, a fee uh, related to that. So really I think the key element here is that it's supplemental. It's not meant to be um, something that's replacing DCs, but it ended up being a tool that you could consider in addition to what's provided through the DC legislation and the parkland provisions. Now certainly as outlined in the report, there's, there's some uh, both pros and cons associated with the community be uh, benefits charge framework. Um, certainly one of the benefits might be that it could replace any potential lost revenue as a result of uh, further legislation that came forward related to Bill 23. 
Now that, um, that also included exempting some services that were originally uh, eligible under DC, such as parking and cemetery uh, services that, you know, CBC could be looked at, whether that made sense as a tool to cover off some of those growth related costs for those services. Um, certainly things like studies, you know, at some point will no longer be eligible within uh, our, our DC bylaw uh, to be able to be funded. And so it could be a tool to, to look at that as well as our, our parkland shortfall that we know uh, may exist as a result of changes to Bill 23. Um, in addition to that, services that aren't covered through the DC framework such as affordable housing uh, could be included in terms of consideration for something that you could put in a CBC strategy. Now on the, uh, the more negative side, you know, certainly uh, when you think about the CBC tool, it's not something that we expect would generate a significant amount of revenue. So when, you know, we're trying to think about potential losses that might come out of Bill 23, and with that, you know, I think it's important to also say the province has made a commitment to making municipalities whole, and so we're still waiting to see what that looks like. Um, so we don't exactly know what kind of shortfall exists at this point. Um, but even if there wasn't a shortfall, it won't provide a significant amount of additional revenue based on the way that the framework is laid out. Uh, it's essentially 4% of land value, that is the cap that you can actually charge under a CBC uh, strategy. Um, it also only applies to certain developments. So anything that is five stories or more or, or 10 uh, plus residential units, uh, you'd be eligible to charge a CBC charge on. And, um, and so it doesn't apply across the board similar to how development charges would. Uh, and it also requires additional administration and, and there's some costs with that. So this would, be, this would require obviously a consultant for us to use to develop a CBC strategy. Uh, that's something that uh, very similar to when we develop a, a DC bylaw, we would need expertise to do. Um, it also, uh, based on the way that the framework is constructed, requires regular land valuations to take place to understand how the charge uh, would actually apply to individual developments as, uh, as it gets implemented. Um, and then there's also the possibility that it could be appealed to the OLT. Um, so in terms of municipalities that have decided to move forward with this new tool, uh, about 50% of, of those that we know have, have moved forward, uh, their bylaws have been appealed. And certainly at the individual development application level, an appeal could also take place. So there's also that risk uh, in terms of a new tool that's really not tested in terms of how the implementation of that might work and what resources we might need on our end as well in terms of moving ahead with that. And so that's really why we're in front of you today to really uh, seek direction before moving ahead with any type of work in terms of either developing a CBC strategy and, and potential bylaw. Um, because we would be retaining a consultant to do that work. We thought it was important to check in with, with council, very similar to what we do before we start a DC uh, bylaw update. Um, and so with that, Chair Derry, I turn it back to you. If there's any questions from committee, happy to answer those. There are at least five uh, that have questions. I'm not sure if you're comfortable there, if you wanted to say this. Okay, standing's great. Uh, beginning with Councillor Singh. Yes, uh, Mr. Lockenbach, um, it's kind of surprising that 18 have adopted and nine have been appealed. Of the 18 that have adopted now, uh, have gone through, and it, the CBC is in place, uh, any cities that are comparable to Kitchener or, you know, as a, as a regional size? Uh, so through the chair, firstly, I don't have that information today. Um, Mr. Hagee, you know, had that detail in terms of what went into the report, so I can't speak to that in terms of what what um, sense of, of size. I know there are large municipalities that have moved forward. Um, I know in the report, in comparison to similar size, like Oakville being one of them, in terms of what their, um, you know, potential, you know, size that might be comparable in terms of development. Um, City of Waterloo has adopted a strategy as well. Uh, but again, in terms of on the list of who's been appealed or not, I don't have that information. Okay. Today. No, the only reason why I mention is I'm um, happy to uh, move the item, Mr. Chair, and also I think this is something that we should be looking at. Um, especially in the soft cost. So uh, it's more of a little bit of a comment. I would hope that we look at those municipalities. So we have already lessons that we can learn uh, what's passing through and what's being, re uh, what's being appealed. The, the other question is because of the inconsistency and perhaps the, uh, the amount is so small, because it's only 4% related to not the overall build but the land value uh, only, are we looking for or should we consider very low hanging fruit immediate quick wins to the, um, the surrounding neighborhoods or the community at large or more specifically affordable housing where we can get a quick turnaround and again if this 
the, uh, this type of funding is not available perhaps in the future if there's a reorg, that it wouldn't necessarily impact us down the road either. Is that some consideration as part of the review? So through the chair, one, one strategy we could look at as we develop, if, it, if the decision was to move forward, would be looking at what those type of services are that would make sense and maybe not um, propose you know, a significant amount of work in terms of trying to understand, you know, for example, if it was something that covers from DC charges, um, you know, maybe avoiding those services you know, and looking at some of the others that are exempt or outside of that framework would probably be the approach that we would recommend. Um, the only other piece that, that may be a consideration, obviously, is on parkland. I think that's one area that we know, um, you know, there's some challenges in terms of funding, so that might be another area that we could consider. But certainly being focused in terms of what we want to look at, I think, would, would benefit us in terms of a strategy. So it's funny that you triggered the parkland thing as opposed to purchasing new lands. Uh, I, I really saw this as a community benefit uh, where we can redevelop our existing parks, where we can't necessarily do that through DCs. Um, and, uh, you know, our community struggle of not seeing new infrastructure coming in or long palliative time period of redevelopment. Could the CBC model help to redevelop par existing parks as well? So through the chair, it does have to be growth related. So very similar to DCs, it would have to be something that is new. Yeah, of course, it's um, new. It's growing, and, yeah. And so it'd be, it would have to be something we explore in terms of what does that look like compared to uh, existing versus versus new and, and understand what that methodology would be within this type of strategy. What's the projected timeline? So if there's support, um, consultant is hired, when would this likely come back to committee and council? So through the chair, uh, it likely would be similar timeline to a DC update. So it likely would be the rest of this year to kind of work through the strategy, probably sometime in 2024 within the first half of the year uh, for consideration, uh, just given you know, having all of the, the costs that we'd have to work through and understanding what, the, what builds into that strategy. Would it be applications that at that point uh, come after that adoption of a new CBC bylaw or could we retroactively look um, going back as well? Is there a mechanism? So through the chair, I believe it's the effective date of whenever the bylaw comes in place um, that it would be effective and so it would be on an ongoing go forward, go forward basis. basis. Okay. Uh, one last thing is um, to not limit development and you know, start throw a, a hindrance uh, for growth as well. Perhaps some consideration of collection on um, building permit as opposed to early on in the uh, application process as part of a development application. Oh, sorry, no, not building permit. <laughs> Occupancy permit, not at the building permit. So it's a later stage of development as opposed to at the onset of development. So through the chair, my understanding is the fees determined the day before building permit issuance in terms of the valuation. So uh, we look at that in terms of the timing, but my understanding is that building permit stage. But what, what my question in the remaining time, could we not look at where it's in the tail end on occupancy stage just so that we can be supportive for growth as well? So through the chair, we'd have to look at the legislation to see what's allowed, but certainly I think the way that we read it right now, it's at the building permit okay. collection stage. Well, I would so. hope that we explore that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councilor. Yeah, that's something I've been saying for a while. My understanding is staff literally is not allowed to receive fees at occupancy, which would make a whole lot more sense if we're interested in promoting growth. Uh, Councilor Chapman. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just wondering um, what the other municipalities have focused that have adopted CBCs, what, what have they focused that money on? So through the chair, I um, certainly could speak more to City of Waterloo, looking at what they proposed. So affordable housing was one of those areas. Um, certainly parking, being an exempt service, was an area. You know, I think the, um, uh, you know, public art, public realm, like there are certain, certain elements uh, that they built into their strategy. You do need to have a capital forecast that justifies what those costs are to build the strategy, and so that's the other piece that goes along with that. Um, and so there is detail that's needed uh, through that development. But those are some of the examples of the types of things that um, certainly they looked at, and other cities uh, would look take a similar approach in terms of some of those services that might not be included in the DC legislation. So when we say affordable housing, maybe you can elaborate a bit on that, because as we know, that's the region that that actually builds and oversees that that work. Um, so where, where would we figure in with the, with the help of these CBC charges? Yeah, so through the chair, that is something that we would need to explore more in terms of developing a strategy. Um, we have had conversations with our existing DC consultant. I think 
you know, uh, to your point of the upper tier and responsibility related to that service and, and then the lower tier, what that looks like in terms of what those costs might be. Um, and so I don't have detail in terms of, you know, City of Waterloo, for example. The one thing I can say is that upper tiers are not allowed to put in place a CBC, and so that's been something uh, that, um, you know, is different than a single tier that has that ability. And so we would look at that and explore that through developing a strategy to see, you know, what that avenue might be and what it, what it relates to in terms of a lower tier uh, in that context. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Deneau. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Davey. So this only applies to five stories or units that are 10 or more residential, right? Do you know how much, um, what we would have financially gained in the last year if we were to look at the builds that have been approved of that specific um, height and, and units? Uh, so through the chair, uh, we weren't able to get that information to, to put in the report. It will be something that we'll look at uh, you know, as we develop a strategy. Uh, and then come back to council if that is the direction that you provide us with today. Um, typically, that is what you do: is you look at sort of historically what is you know the number of, of development that's taken place, but you also look kind of future growth in terms of what's expected. And so that's um, that's what we'd come back with in terms of a future report if the direction was provided to move ahead. Okay, and you know, I guess my concern is, you know, is the implementation of this going to cost more than the actual return? You know, since I've been on council, I don't think we've maybe approved maybe one five-story or, or, you know, we're approving lots of high-rises, which this doesn't apply to. So through the chair, it would, it would apply to anything above five stories, so for clarification. So it's five or more or ten or more units. Okay. So it's yeah. just, it doesn't apply to Sorry. anything lower than that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. Councillor Clancy. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I feel like anything we can do to make our community better and generate some funds for that is good. Um, I'm intrigued that only half of, of the cities that have, or municipalities that have uh, put this forward have been challenged in the OLT. I wonder if that will stay the case. So I guess that's something to monitor that not all have gone forward with that. Um, and yeah, just curious if anecdotally, just from your what you've um, researched so far. Is there a theme to which municipal municipalities are being challenged and which ones are not? So through the chair, I don't think there's a theme. I think, it, I think part of um, seeing more appeals is that this is a new tool. And so I think it's realistic to expect that it will be tested um, as you put a strategy in place. I think that's why, you know, as we move forward initially, you know, we've taken approach of, of having the benefit of, of when we, if we decide to go forward, seeing what other municipalities have done, seeing what the challenges have been, um, and then, you know, developing our strategy to, um, to address some of those things, you know, as best we can. Um, but I would expect that, you know, the risk of appeal is, is likely high anytime you have a new tool that's been introduced um, in terms of testing both the methodology that goes behind a strategy. Um, and, and the fact that it's, you know, it's sort of been untested in terms of, um, you know, something that, that the province has introduced. Yeah, 15, there's some odds there, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you. There's no left in the queue. I have a couple of questions. Um, first, actually, working backwards. So my understanding is they would, the developer on any given application can appeal. So to the chair, that, so that's correct in terms of how the legislation reads. Uh, you know, in terms of it, the valuation is determined the day before a building permit uh, is issued in terms of the individual development. Now, there are ways that I think we can try to address that, both looking at sort of standardized process in a geographical area in terms of what valuation might be and applying that methodology. And so I think we can reduce that risk, um, but it certainly is a, a possibility. I think it depends on how your strategy is put together. You know, uh, having that approved first um, will dictate you know how many one-off type of appeals might happen through an individual development. Okay, that's helpful. Um, are you aware? Do all the other regular OLT rules apply in terms of you know, like would they be able to go after legal costs if they were found in the right, or is that maybe you don't know offhand? But I'm curious. Like, so, are there other legal financial penalties? Uh, if we lose, I guess, at an OLT appeal, other than not getting the full amount. So through the chair, I don't have that information to know what that looks like? No, that's fine. More importantly, I, I understand, so the province is 
looking as via Bill 23 there. Recall they're looking at the financials of a couple savings too um, to try and honor this whole idea of making uh, municipalities whole. One of my fears when I was reading this report over the weekend was that one of the potential outcomes from that process might be this being duplicated and whatever way they try to make us whole, this might be wiped out as part of that process. Is that, is that a possibility? And if not, why not? So through the or to the chair, um, certainly Bill 23, I think, complicates things a little bit in terms of, you know, the CBC framework was something that was introduced prior to Bill 23. I'm not sure it's been fully contemplated how that interacts, you know, with the, the current legislation that's come out uh, through that process. Um, you know, certainly that will be something that we monitor if we do decide to move forward, you know, have direction to do that. Uh, we'll look at um, what those changes might mean and then um, obviously bring a report back to council to update you uh, and you'll still have a chance to decide whether this is something you want to move ahead with once a strategy is developed it doesn't mean that we have to move ahead with the bylaw um, certainly you know understanding what those impacts are will be important and so we're still waiting on some pieces of, the, of that information uh, specifically right to bill 23 and, and what that looks like um, but we're hopeful that we will receive that as we go through this process if it's something that we, we move ahead with. Okay, yeah, my concern is spending the money on a consultant before it comes back. So do we have any idea, um, has the province given any indication, I'm not aware, have they given any indication of when they expect to be able to come back with the results of the findings of those financial explorations and those other those two municipalities? Uh, not that I'm aware of in terms of a definitive timeline. I know they're looking at it. Um, Certainly with the regulations, we are hopeful that those would be out as well by now, so we would have more detail in terms of what those, you know, concrete impacts might be, and we're still waiting on that as well. Um, so we're hopeful it's within this year, um, but uh, your guess is as good as mine in terms of timing. Okay, and is there any risk other than, I guess, potential lost revenue if things stay as they are? Is there any other risk if, like, I, I'm inclined to support this now, but is there any risk if we were to defer it pending that decision that you foresee? So to the chair, no, I, I wouldn't see a risk if council decided this is something you want to explore right now. Certainly, you know, we can look at it again a year in a year's time. Um, I think the only risk is obviously if there was some revenue that it would generate, you know, the sooner that we put something in place, the more uh, opportunity to, to collect on that. Um, but given the amount that we're looking at, it's, it's not a significant uh, risk if, if you decide it was something you wanted to wait on. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Chapman's queued back in for questions. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Well, no, it's not a question, it's a comment, sorry. For a comment? Okay, actually, that's fine too. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I just want to say that I'm really pleased to see this coming forward. Um, I think it's, um, it, I mean, I have thought this from the very beginning when we, heard, when we learned about it. Um, even this was before Bill 23 and the, the removal of some of the DC charges. Um, so I'm hoping that we can draw on some of the bylaws or strategies that other municipalities have implemented. Um, to maybe somewhat expedite the process because I think, um, you know, work has been done and, you know, we don't have to repeat what, what others are already doing. Um, and I do think that while it may not replace all of the DC charges that we lose, I think it's a great way to replace some of those lost revenues. Um, and I would like to see, this is my, <laughs> my suggestion, that um, some of this money, if not all of it, well, certainly affordable housing, once we get better clarity on what that would look like, but on parkland um, until we get to a place where, where we meet those um, demands that were um, presented to us in an earlier, earlier report. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duneau. Thank you, Chair uh, Davey. And my, my question kind of aligns with uh, Councillor Chapman. So instead of spending $100,000 on a consultant, are we not able to, like she had talked about, we look at the other uh, municipalities, take what, what we think is best from them um, and put it into our own uh, bylaw or is it more of a staffing issue that we can't do that? So through the chair, um, you know, I think it's the fact that, that it's a very complex framework and so I don't believe we have staff resources that could do, and I think based on timing, would not be able to, to do that work. Um, you know, in terms of the consultants that we use, it is the same consultant we use for our DC study. So they, they sort of understand the methodology that, that some of the CBC was built on. 
Um, so it really is for those expertise in terms of both how does it align with the legislation, you know, how does it minimize any risk that it could be appealed or if it was, you know, what's our, what's our ability to defend, what a strategy might be. Um, so it is in our interest to have those that are more experts in this space um, lend support in terms of developing any kind of strategy. So I guess as far as a consultant goes, um, do you normally use a consultant like that's kind of familiar with the kitchen, uh, with Kitchener, or would you look for a consultant who possibly has consulted with the other municipalities? So again, they have the expertise to see what has what has worked, what hasn't worked, and and come to our own uh, policy here. So through the chair, um, there are really two main consulting consultants in this space in terms of development charges. Uh, and so we would use the same consultant um, and actually have direct from council to do so. When this was originally contemplated back when the DC changes happened, we got approval to move ahead with a CBC work um, after doing a DC update. Um, and so it would be Hemson Consulting that, that has prepared our, our DC bylaw. That would also be the consultant that would lend support on this. They have prepared CBCs for other municipalities and so they, they will be able to provide that insight. Um, they do have connections with the other consulting firms as well, and so we'll be able to learn from that in terms of what's our, what our best approach might be for an overall strategy. Okay, thank you. Councilor Singh, your comment? Yes. Okay, so I'm actually going to flip it this time because you're out of the room for a second. I think my, you might want to hear my comments before you make yours, if you don't mind. Um, so just because you're out, no. So I indicated when you're out that I am I'm, I'm inclined to support this uh, here at committee, but there's a, I think there's a decent probability I'll move deferral um, come council, and my rationale is simply that the, the, the province has implemented a number of bills in rapid succession that I think in some ways are contradictory. Uh, they're cutting DCs in one place and they're implementing uh, credit back to us in another place. And meanwhile, while they're doing that, um, they're right now, my understanding is they're looking at the, uh, the books of a couple of municipalities to find out how they can make us whole as they had promised in terms of uh, the development charge cuts. So my hope is that between now and my part, but I think if we could do some advocacy possibly to the province to say, you know what, you're just set an amount that we're allowed to collect, an unappealable, an unappealable amount, so the OLT isn't part of the picture uh, as a result of what you're looking at in terms of making this whole that might replace this entire process and save us some time and some complications. So that's my intention between now and, and council, if that, if that makes some logical sense, but it, I would be looking to defer it until um, the province comes back with uh, the results of those two financial audits of the municipalities with respect to DCs. Okay, Councillor Singh. Just clarity, are you looking to defer that now or are you going to potentially look at that in council? At council? I think our comments aren't going to be too far uh, apart, Councillor Davey. I agree with uh, mostly everything that you said and that was going to be my comments to figure out a way how to supportively uh, encourage what the, you know, the, uh, the recommendation is while at the same time uh, recognize that we should use this bylaw for what the benefit of this bylaw should be, and is is, is the uh, you know how, why the province is allowing this as a tool. I w wouldn't necessarily want it to replace lost revenue. It should not go towards how do we figure back to supplement the lost DCs, the lost parkland dedication fees. The province is making the decision that they're making and giving municipalities to grow in a way within those those boundaries and adjust your budgeting and growth perspectives according to those realities. That being said, I agree with Councillor Davey that there is a lot of work to do through advocacy that we should uh, try to, you know, lay out exactly where we don't have the ability to, um, you know, reorg uh, our DC bylaws where we can make ourselves whole, where it, that does need to be some sort of ways for the, the province to pay back to the municipalities, and that's the same thing true for the park then, uh, parkland dedication fee. So it, it, there's a lot of time I think we have to wait to see exactly how that's going to get balanced as well. But I think if this this proceeds forward, and but you know I, I would likely support the deferral as well. But if we don't, and staff look at this bylaw for the nature of what it's for, which is how do we bring community benefit through growth? That is, how do we make our parks better, existing parks, not building new parks? We have a bylaw already for that. How do we make our existing trails 
much better? How do we create additional uh, resources of services through the soft, you know, so, uh, soft charges that we're not able to incorporate into DCs? Then I think it's fine. I think it can proceed forward. So um, I'll look to see what you have in mind, Councillor Davy. But I think we can support this. We can give direction to start taking a look at this, encouraging within the scope that we want to see strong community benefits coming back through this fee and bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Councillor Anetis. Thank you, Chair Davey. And just to follow up on the lot, your comments and, and Councillor Singh's comments, and uh, just for the clarification, is it my understanding that you're concerned if we pass this that we would get less funding from being whole from the, from the province? My primary concern is that there's $100,000 allocated for consultants and going through the process only to have, as we've seen in the past, the whole thing get thrown out the window um, and then losing that revenue as well. So that's my primary concern. Okay. Thank you. Okay. There's no one else in the queue. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Singh. Those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Okay. Moving along to where are we at? Natural Gas Purchasing Policy Review. And there's no presentation or anything this item? Okay, so uh, looking for a mover, moved by Councillor Nidus. Uh Any questions on this? I only have one if no one else does. Uh, oh, Councillor Clancy, go ahead. Yeah, I guess um, I, I just wanted to be a little curious. I read about transportation contracts being negotiated um, on a 20 year timeline. I guess I, you know, I know there's a lot of uncertainty about the future of natural gas and just wondering if, if perhaps there is an interest or is, if it would make sense to kind of have shorter term contracts just to not have, be locked in and have any consequences if things change over the next 20 years. That seems like a long runway, but I defer to you guys to hear what you, Say. Sorry, gentlemen, I thought maybe Ms. McGoldrick was handling this one solo. I would have waited. But anyway, did you hear the question? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the chair, I think the natural uh, length for a transportation contract is 20 years. Even Enbridge contracts run for 20 years. Uh, we can always look at, we currently have only one transportation contract. So we don't usually have that much of a transportation contract. We have only one transportation contract, I, which is 15 years to go. We will always be, we can always look to make it shorter if, if that's the direction we need to go through. Yeah, I just, I, I know the, with climate change, there's so much that we don't know about uh, how our energy future looks. And so that just a consideration. Um, yeah, and okay, that's it for me, thank you. Uh, thank you. I just have one question. I noticed that um, we're looking to, in an effort to get lower costs, we're looking at um, broadening the pool of um, suppliers that can bid, um, which I, I think is, is a good idea, although, although it comes with risk. I did notice, I believe I saw in the, the bylaw that we, from any one provider, we cannot um, purchase more than 50% of our required supply. Okay. Would that be applicable to the lowest tier uh, non-investment non grade, investment grade, um, suppliers as well. Oh, sorry, hang on. Need to queue in there. Chair, that is there correct. Go. We will, uh, the 50% rule will apply to all suppliers. On an annual basis, we will not buy more than 50% our, than of our gas from more than one supplier. Okay, so that would apply to even the new, newly opened up suppliers and, and staff's comfortable with that level of risk. I assume I was in the court. Okay. No, I'm, I'm fine with it if, if you are. And my most died. Okay. I, Councillor Ioannidis, one second here. Ah, there we go. Councillor Ioannidis. I, I have a comment to staff after we're, we're, we vote on this. After we vote on this? Okay. No problem. Okay. There are no further questions. Uh, sorry. Who moved this? Councillor Ioannidis, you moved this, right? I'll move it. Yeah. Okay. I okay. Did move it, yeah. Uh, don't see any discussion. Those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Councillor Andrews, you wanted to comment on this? Yeah, I just wanted to let staff know I received a, a notice in the mail about 
water being overused in my house and I should check my things and it worked out perfect for me thanks for that notice and uh, I wish I I wish I checked my mailbox sooner but. <laughs> Here you go, some positive feedback. Okay, so that concludes the natural gas purchasing policy review. Up next is the appointment of licensing appeal tribunal members. Um, so basically, if you guys read that report, we're looking for three uh, volunteers to be on that um, appeal board. If I'm, you're welcome to nominate someone else. I'm not seeing my display light up. <laughs> It's, uh, so it was, yeah, it, it's going to take place after the summer recess, and it's one day. It shouldn't take that long of the day, but you should book off the full day. Um, Councillor Singh, go ahead. Yeah, it's just one day, right, you said? It's, it's one day, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And you can nominate myself as well if you want. Sure, I'll nominate sure. Councillor Davey. And Councillor Oduni? Councillor Oduni, okay. Uh, any other, anyone else have a burning desire to be on this? Okay, no votes? Okay, great. Those in favor? And that carries. Okay. And lastly is the Manchester Road Traffic Calming Review. And, uh, sorry, yeah, there's no presentation for this. Um, anyone have any questions on this item? Oh, Councillor Schneider. Comments, comments. Comment, go ahead. There's no questions. So okay. Oh, great. I just want to say, uh, I, in all my years on council, I don't think I've ever seen such a high response rate and such a high positive response to the plans being made. So, uh, great work. <laughs> yeah, that's that exactly what I was going to say. It's one of my pet peeves on council is when we go out and do work that effectively divides the community. We've seen that happen, unfortunately, with things like sidewalks, et cetera. It's very rare to see this sort of level of, um, I don't know, cohesive vision in terms of traffic calming. So credit to staff. I guess it also probably means a lot about what the residents are facing there on that street. So uh, could I get a mover for this? Councillor Schneider, uh, not seeing any other comments. Those in favor? Any, none opposed, that carries. Thank, thank you. Can I get a motion to adjourn Finance and Corporate Services Committee, moved by Councillor Oduni. Those in favor? And that carries. We will now get into special counsel, I believe. Just switch, okay. And I'm doing that as well, apparently. Mayor isn't here, so that would be.